I'm making this talk about saws in particular that don't have a riving knife. So it's not even a consideration for this talk right here. Also, I think that it's better to know how to prevent uh, kickback than rather than let something else try to do that for you. If you know more about the material you're working with and how it's gonna react, you'll better be able to prevent it regardless of the safety equipment you have on your saw. The first thing I wanna talk about with regards to kickback is you need to learn something about the stuff that you're gonna be cutting. All right, I have here is your standard two by four and these are notorious for kickback or jamming up, mainly because when these are cut from the forest, they're of course green, and then they go and they get milled down to some rough side. I don't know the exact process these days, but eventually it gets sent through a kiln that rapidly pulls the moisture out of there and it gets it down to around 15, 16%, sometimes as low as 12. I've measured these as soon as I've taken them from the big box store and, I've, and they've been as low as say 10% if they're sitting around for a long time and as high as say 18%. So there's quite a bit of variability there. Now it's not the moisture per se that's the problem. It is the stresses that build up in the wood when you rapidly dry it. Of course, wood is a natural product and it has things like knots and other grain variations in it that cause the density of the wood to be different in different places. And it's these density differences that cause the internal stress to build up. So that when you cut it, you're releasing these stress. It wants to bend inwards or bend outwards. Almost anyone that's cut one of these things has seen that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one, I'm going to cut it. Um, this 2x4 has been down in my basement for months on end, so it's fairly dry. And when you leave wood uh, that's kiln dried for months on end to dry, what happens is it naturally releases those stresses that build up. Although there might be some here. Now the things to watch out for when you are cutting a 2x4 like this are knots. Okay, you've got two knots here, and what may happen is as you cut down the middle here, this may try to close together, and it'll pinch on the back of the blade and try to kick back. All right, I'm going to rip this right down the middle, and we'll see if it actually, you know, reacts. First thing I'm going to do is set the height of my blade up to just slightly higher than the wood that I'm cutting through. I'm going to set my fence to one and three quarters, and I'm going to start my cut. Okay, I had to stop there and show you what's going on. It probably would have been a lot more dramatic <laughs> if the wood had been less dry. If I had got this maybe two or three months ago after I bought it from the, you know, the Home Depot. But it started to pinch together and you can see it here. I'll get a picture and put it in here. And it's these two knots that are causing this um, pinching to happen. The stress is built up around these knots and it's causing that wood to turn inwards like that. When I was cutting this, I was aware of that situation. So I was holding the work firmly. I was listening for a change in the tone of the saw. I had, you know, good contact with the wood here so I could feel if it was starting to bind. And I just stopped the saw to show you what's going on here. Now under normal circumstances, I would just continue cutting this as long as it's not stalling the saw or binding up so badly that it's actually pushing back at me, I would press on and I would continue cutting until I, you know, got through the, the cut that I need to make. But it, just to show you what you can do if it starts to happen, you want to stop the saw, pull the work off, you can make that cut again, actually start the saw and recut that curve so it widens out and that will lessen the chances of it kicking back. The other way to deal with a closing up kerf like that is to have a wedge and stick in there to push it open. After it starts to bind, push the wedge in, make sure it's a wooden wedge, not a steel one. And you can see that the blade passes easily through the kerf now, and that'll stop it from binding, pinching on the saw. 
The other thing that can happen, you know, other than the pinching, say you're cutting the standard two by four here again, is that it may curve, you know, as you're starting to cut it, it could curve. Both pieces actually curve away from the saw this way. And then what will happen is that'll press up against the back side of the blade and that'll uh, start to kick back as well. The solution for that is also the wedge. If you can get the wedge in there, also, if you can stop the saw and recut the curve, that'll help a lot as well. Okay, that's basically it for solid wood, the things that you should look out for. There are other things that I can't think of at this moment, but all these things come with actually, you know, using the saw, making these cuts. Practice is where you learn a lot about how to cut wood safely. Uh, plywood. This is a piece of maple veneer particle board core plywood. That's what we call it. And um, plywood generally doesn't twist or warp when you cut it because it's usually, you know, not under any stress. It's made, it's a manufactured product. And once it's put together, it's, it's basically stable. It doesn't, you know, expand or contract or twist or warp too much or, it's usually not a factor when you're cutting it, but there are some things that you need to be aware of when you're cutting sheet stock or panels like this. You can say that the really big one is not to make this cut right here. We'll say eight inch piece. And you need, you know, you need this piece to be eight inches and then try to cut it this way. The problem with making this cut, if you're not experienced, is that there's a, a better chance of it rocking into the blade as you're pushing it through. All it takes is a little bit for this to come off the fence at the back, push into the side of the blade and kick back at you. The other problem is that as you're completing your cut, what can happen, because since you're pushing on both sides of the, of the work as it's passing through the blade, you could push that curve together and pinch it at the back and that will cause kickback. And if you, and this is something that can happen, if you've never done this before, it can really make you shit your pants, basically, because um, it's totally unexpected. But that's what can happen. And I'm gonna try to demonstrate that a little bit in the safest way I possibly can here. Okay, that's it coming off the fence and you actually you can see the blade pushing sideways. I had a really firm grip on it and I knew that it could kick back, but I didn't go far enough to make it actually happen. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is to, uh, <laughs> and I don't know if I should actually do this, try to make a pinch at the back. Okay, I got my heart restarted. <laughs> you can see how quickly that happens. Uh, if you're doing that and you don't know what can happen, like that would ruin your day. You would walk away from this thing and never return type thing. But those are the two things you have to be aware of when you're making this particular cut on the table saw. Now, if you're cutting Okay, this, you need a piece that's eight inches wide. The best thing to start off with is something that's just a little bit wider than that. And then firmly pass it through the blade like this. That way you don't have this big massive piece out here to try to worry about. So the best solution for this kind of thing is to rough cut it with either circular saw or miter saw or something like that, rather than try to make this cut on a table saw. The other way to do it is if you have a sled. And you know, the sled, what the sled does is it supports the stock all the way across at the back as you push it through. There's still 
it still may pinch, but there's quite a lot less uh, probability of that happening. Okay, so I'll make that cleanup cut to get rid of this ragged edge here. And I'll talk about something that I talked about in the previous video on push sticks. And that's, it's dang more dangerous to try to cut this size piece with a push stick than using your hands. In all circumstances, you want to hold on to this piece and guide it through. What your fingers will do that this push stick can't is feel what the wood is going to do. Your fingertips will also grip the surface and you'll be able to push it into the saw. I've heard talk, people talk about their hand got pulled into the blade. <clears throat> a lot of times what happens there, that's a failure of technique. Whenever I'm pushing wood through the saw, my hand is always going that way. I'm pushing not straight through or towards the blade. I'm pushing straight through and towards the fence. So I'm holding the stock up against the fence. You gotta imagine that it's going this way. And that's the way you always want to be pushing your stock through the saw. You don't take it and push it forwards, you push it sideways type thing. I'm letting the saw spin down because this is another thing that I see quite often. You'll notice what I did there. I let the saw stop. I didn't mess around with this piece right here. I see guys trying to move that out of the way with a push stick or whatever, and you don't have to. Kickback only happens between the blade and the fence. That's the only place where kickback can happen between something that's spinning and something that doesn't move. And these pieces that fall off on the side here, they can be in the way, but they're never a danger. So. Leave them where they are until the saw stops. Don't get in there with your push stick trying to mess around pushing out of the way. What happens if the blade is still spinning or spinning down is the tip of the push stick can get in the, in the saw there and you know come back at you type thing. So you get a kickback type thing with that. So leave those things there where they're at and don't worry about them. Okay, I talked about using a sled to make you know panel cutting safer. And I said that it can possibly pinch the blade at the back. And the reason for that is if your stock is not absolutely straight on the edge where it goes up against the fence, if you put it up against the fence and you notice a gap between the stock and the fence where the blade is, that's gonna pinch. If it's supported on both sides and a gap in the middle, it will close together as you complete your cut and cause a kickback. I chickened out the last second there. I was gonna try to make the cut but I said that it's not worth it because I'm holding the sled with my thumbs basically only, you know, keep pushing it forwards. And that can kick back violently enough and with enough force to sprain your thumbs or even break them. So you'll have to use your imagination. I've got my mini table saw sled, put in my saw here. This is the one I mostly use to point out something else. And that's um, situations where you're cutting many pieces the same length and you want to set up a stop block. So I'm going to quickly cut a stop block here. See, I broke my own rule. I pushed this block out of the way and I also use my stick here to break the blade. <laughs> anyway, so here's my stop block and I'm going to, you know, put a clamp on it so it doesn't move. Clamp that on there nice and tight so that you know I can cut several pieces the same length. Right now that length is arbitrary. Now when you're making this cut, and I see this all the time too, and not only on the table saw with a sled like this, on the miter saw as well. When I said about kickback only happening between the spinning blade and the fence as in a spinning blade and a thing that doesn't move, the same thing can happen here in this circumstance. I see guys holding the piece that's not constrained in any way, and the other piece that's up against that stop is loose between the blade and that stop. So you've got a kickback situation there. So you push it through the blade, and then when you pull it back, what happens is the piece that you've cut off tries to drag a little bit 
against the table or against the blade and gets jammed between the blade and the stop here and causes a kickback. You always, always, always want to hold that piece that's being cut off between the blade and the stop. Now, if the piece is bigger, you can use your hands like I'm using here. And if it's small, you can use a pencil or a small stick, whatever it takes to hold that piece in place so that it can't move as it passes through the blade. I should point out that it's always a good idea to complete the cut by pushing it all the way through the blade rather than trying to return it. You double your chances of kickback that way. Okay, that about wraps this one up. There are things that you can do with your equipment to ensure or try to safeguard against kickback as well. And these are things that you should do immediately after you get your table saw. It doesn't matter if it's new, used, whatever, straight out of the box, right from the place, wherever you bought it, brand new. You should make these checks to make sure that it's lined up properly. You gotta make sure that the blade is in line with the miter slots. That's the first test. The miter slots are what guides uh, jigs and you know T-squares and all this stuff through the saw. So these two have to be parallel. The blade has to be absolutely in line with these miter slots. Then your fence has to be in line with the miter slots as well. So parallel, parallel, parallel. There shouldn't be any, uh, I've, I've seen this before. People set their fence so that there's more of a gap at the back. You don't wanna do that. You wanna have your fence set so that it's absolutely in line with the blade with no you know, offset. And definitely, if you want to avoid kickback of any kind, do not set the fence so that it's tighter at the back than at the front. Mm -hmm.